We are no longer wondering whether machines can think. We're now asking what they are thinking and on whose behalf. Two years ago, when I spoke with the legendary thinker Stephen Wolfram and asked him if AI will replace us, his answer was disarmingly clear. Automation takes human goals and lets them be implemented and executed. The goals are not automatable. In other words, as long as we define the goal, we're still in charge. But how long can we claim that control on artificial intelligence? To explore the deeper risks, the ones we rarely confront, I turn to Roman Vladimirovich Yampolsky, a computer scientist specializing in AI safety and cybersecurity, a professor at the University of Louisville. His research doesn't just ask what AI can do, but what it could undo. As Professor Yampolsky warns, once we lose control, there may be no second chance. In this conversation, we explore dangerous and uncomfortable truths from narrow system to superintelligence, and what happens when a single failure becomes unrecoverable. Roman Yampolsky, welcome. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I want to start with a bit of context. Uh, recently, I had um, an in-depth conversation with Stefan Wolfram about uh, AI computation and, and complexity. I had one question when, in mind when I, when I met him. I wanted to know whether AI is going to replace us. He said, as long as we define the objective, we're still in charge. Do you share Stephen Wolfram's confidence? He seems to be right. If we are still deciding on what the goals are, then uh, we are still in charge. The problem is we don't know how to do that. Let's bring it to uh, something practical. Uh, cognitive technologies are already reshaping the, the so-called uh, knowledge economy. Uh, I'm, I'm a journalist. I could ask AI to write this entire interview but it wouldn't know which questions truly matter. As long as I understand my audience, uh, my role uh, remain in a certain way relevant, okay? But is that enough? Do you think AI will ever reach a point where it can replace creative labor? I suspect today it can replace most journalists. They are not asking any innovative questions. It's usually the same 10 questions in all the <laughs> interviews. So. Yeah, easy. There is a French uh, pro proverb uh, that says la nature a horreur du vide, um, which, which can be translated into nature doesn't doesn't to tolerate emptiness or vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, AI doesn't think. Uh, it simply uh, it simply fills the vacuum with stati statistical predictions. Would you say AI is capable of of true creativity or is it, it is just highly sophisticated sophisticated imitation. Do you think an average person is doing anything truly creative? Most people compare AI to the best of humans. They want it to be better than Einstein, better than uh, you know the greatest minds, Newton and so on. But uh, it's already way more creative than an average person. Average person does absolutely nothing creative. They don't write music, books, art. And for the ones who do, I think AI is outperforming them in many domains, not in all of them. We still have a few things like stand-up comedy is still reserved for human minds, but uh, in pretty much everything else, AI is taking over. How could something um, that imitates become creative? How do your children become creative, right? They start by imitating parents and then at some point they're smarter than you, they're more knowledgeable. I think it's a very limited uh, view to say they're just doing statistical matching. They, in many domains, already have accomplished uh, novel strategies, novel engineering designs. Uh, I think they're better than most uh, computer programmers in coding. So I, I, I think uh, a lot of people don't fully understand the state of the art in AI. It is the thing when, when you when you work manually you develop an instinct of for what feels right and wrong, right? If, if you let AI handle everything from the start, you lose that instinct, don't you? Yeah, you will definitely become kind of useless in many domains if AI takes over. That's, that's one of the big problems. We don't know what we can contribute in a world with super intelligence in it. Yeah, okay, we're, we're, go we're going to talk about the risks. It's, it's like accepting the first uh, answer from chat GPT and calling it perfect. Uh, but in reality, 
you need maybe to spend more time to to refine it uh, before calling it uh, almost flawless. Doesn't that create a risk uh, of intellectual complacency? Sure. Absolutely. And it's the same with having an assistant. Initially, you check their work. After a <laughs> while, you trust them and they can do whatever they want. That's exactly the same. You've published a very interesting paper called uh, Artificial Intelligence, Safety and Cybersecurity, a Timeline of AI Failures, in which you make a crucial distinction between narrow AI, where failures can be mitigated, and AGI, where a single failure could be catastrophic. Uh, that, that's a that's a strong statement, by the way. What kind of scenario are, are we talking about here? Uh, is it is it a slow burn collapse or or a, a instant irreversible consequences? So one of the properties of smarter than you systems is that you cannot predict specifics of what they can do. When you're asking me what a smarter system AI which is maybe general or even super intelligent will do is you asking me what I would do. And I can tell you about synthetic biology, nanotech, nuclear weapons, all the standard risks we know about. But if a system is truly smarter than us, it can come up with completely novel inventions, new technology, which we cannot predict. The point is that if we are not in control, if we are not specifying exactly what's going to happen, then a lot of surprising negative things can happen to us. Let me take an example. Did you see the video where an, a, an, a, an AI agent calls a restaurant to, to book a table or something like that? I don't remember exactly. In the other end, another AI agent picks up. They recognize their both agent AI and switch to uh, an optimized voice language. That's not just automation. That's something closer to autonomy. Would you classify that, this as an AGI? So I don't know if that specific video is real or fake. I have no well, idea anymore. Too. Everything is being generated. But the whole point is, yes, we can absolutely expect uh, what models we're creating now are switching from being just tools to agents. That's that's happening for sure. You've mentioned uh, in your discussion with Lex Friedman that something that really stuck with me, uh, you said the only way to win this game is not to create AGI. And, and that sounds almost apocalyptic. Well, if we don't know how to control those systems and we anticipate them to be better than us at uh, all sorts of important capabilities, negotiating, technology development, doing science, then it seems like a very dangerous proposition to blindly develop them as soon as possible and just kind of see what happens. Yeah, but why do you believe that the mere act of creating AGI is, is a fundamental threat? So that's what we see through history, right? Uh, anytime there was a more advanced civilization meeting a less advanced one, it didn't end up being very good for the less advanced one. They are not competitive. They are not uh, able to enter into some sort of equal equally beneficial relationship. So if you have nothing to contribute and you may be wasting resources or you are a potential competitor in terms of creating other AI systems, uh, you may be seen as an adversary. Okay. So so we've we've seen we've seen a lot of speculation on on AI timelines. Uh, some talk about 2030, some talk about one year, or some talk about two, 2026. Are we still missing something, a key ingredient, let's say? I think at this point, all we need is more compute, more data, more resources. I think scalability hypothesis is basically correct. So it's a question of how much are they willing to invest into getting there. With enough resources, I think it's very possible to get there within a year or two, but uh, I don't know if there is enough investment happening. I know OpenAI was at one point trying to fundraise $7 trillion or something like that. I don't think they succeeded no. yet, so it depends Trump, on what they get. Yeah, Trump just launched the, the Stargate uh, 
initiative, $500 billion, um, I think, of investment. So infrastructure, energy, that's what we need basically to get there. I think so. I think that's the only thing we're missing right now, enough enough resources to run this model to completion of its training, yeah. Okay, let's get back to risks. Speaking of existential risks, we can talk about the X risk, meaning AI could uh, pose a literal uh, existential threat to humanity, but there is also the the, the so-called S risk, and I'm speaking under your supervision, which uh, suggests that even if AGI doesn't uh, wipe us out, it could uh, create scenarios of extreme suffering. How do you differentiate th- these risks and which one do, do you see as more uh, pressing? So differentiating is easy. If you are dead, uh, you had existential problem. If you are in hell and suffering, you have a risk problem. Uh, which one is most likely is not obvious. It depends on uh, really, who is uh, you know instilling initial values in those systems? It's a lot more likely that there is a little benefit to torturing us. So that's a less likely risk, but it's much worse. So it still should be something we give some attention to, consider it as a possibility. Okay. Uh, how about the how about the the control or the lack of control? Uh, AI is increasingly open sourced that's uh that, that's great for innovation i might say but also means that anyone including malevolent actors can use it uh, are we essentially handing weapons to digital use oh, oh, already say that in an interview i, th- I think with lex friedman you talked about digital psychopaths so the question is are we essentially handing weapons to digital psychopaths? So short term, yes, we'll put uh, very dangerous, very capable technology in the hands of random people around the world. None of them are in any way screened for being, you know, human friendly, let's put it this way. But long term, it really doesn't matter. If a system is truly super intelligent, it makes no difference who creates it. If you're not controlling it, you get the same outcome from different countries, different corporations, or even uh, some of those more malevolent groups. Uh, If they're not in charge of it, then the system is an independent agent making its own potentially dangerous decisions. Okay. If if a super intelligence uh, were to become the best version of humanity, what would it look like? Uh, Would it be digital? biological or something beyond maybe our comprehension? I'm not sure what it means to become best version of humanity. I think right now we are optimizing <laughs> it smarter than us, more capable at problem solving, and it's doing a pretty good job of learning about uh, you know our, our world and from our data, and it's learning what we at least reward it for. So it's learning how to make humans happy, but... Uh, there are definitely potential problems with just optimizing for human happiness like that. Okay, let's talk about your last book. So what is the end game of, of AI? The new book coming out, I think the actual public release is tomorrow. Uh, we are looking at, uh, this is a book collaboration with a colleague. So we're not just looking at my standard AI safety research, but uh, also looking at things like consciousness within artificial systems, uh, identity, so personal identity for AI. We are looking at meaning in a world of uh, advanced AI. We're looking at rights for digital entities. So a lot of interesting questions which uh, arise if we are successful, if we somehow figure out how to do those things uh, where we are still around and we are trying to integrate with those systems. Maybe it's a short-term problem, but we are basically looking at uh, a lot of big philosophical questions as they apply to artificial artificial agents. Speaking of philosophy, I know I wasn't going to ask you this question, but since I'm I'm curious, I really need to 
know your take on this. I am a Muslim and Islam means uh, submit to God through, through worship, work, being a good human being, doing good deeds. From your perspective, does that definition of human purpose align with your understanding of, of intelligence? So if you think you are in a created world and you were created by this much more intelligent entity and at that point you're really not in charge. The entity decides what is the right way to live your life. It could be pretty arbitrary. It could be rational. You're really not in control. So if it tells you, you know, you have to pray seven times a day, 20 times a day, that's what you do. That's that's the rules of the game. You are a character in somebody else's uh, simulation. And what do you think about that? I do give a lot of credit to the idea of us being in a simulation. I think it makes a lot of sense if we are making good progress in virtual reality research and in creating those virtual agents, which are human level intelligent, we can populate virtual worlds with them. And so it's uh, very likely that we'll have simulations with billions of intelligent agents in them and to them at least we are the creators and we decide on what the rules are what they need to be doing not to be deleted not to be shut down so there is a lot we can learn from theology about uh, technology we are creating mm -hmm. so we're already in a simulation before we even created ai so according to this to, the, so to this I, I think you can do a pretty good mapping from modern technology terms back to the religious terms so you have this super intelligence creating an artificial world populating it with agents which are in its image meaning intelligent and creative but simplified and the rules given for how to be a good agent and i think it's important that the rules are not just uh, common sense so if you tell everyone okay you need to wash your hands because you know bacteria you don't know if they're listening to you because they obey you or because it's a good idea to wash your hands. If you give them silly rules, you have to wear a funny hat and never eat this animal. Then the reason they obey you is the, the reason they're doing it is because they obey you. So that's a good test for loyalty, good test for control. What movie would you recommend that illustrates the real dangers of, of AI? So movies usually go for visual aspects of it. It's hard to visualize intelligence. So you want something with robotic bodies chasing people with lots of blood. The so Terminator is a classic example, but Ex Machina is a very good movie in terms of addressing some of the deeper questions of this technology. Okay, so thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for inviting me. I hope I answered some of your concerns. Yeah, yeah, totally. You, you've given me a lot of a lot to, to to think about.